Eight years ago, 20th Century Fox, How Green Was My Valley, won five Oscars at the 1942 Academy Awards, including Best Picture and Director for legendary helm John Ford. But it's not the only adaptation of Richard Llewellyn's novel. There was an eight-part series on BBC One in 1960, but today we're going to analyse the differences between John Ford's movie and the six-part BBC series from 1975 directed by Ronald Wilson. Many of the deeper aspects of the movie will be analysed with a full retrospective come reviews on this channel soon, but today is simply a short comparison of the two adaptations as a way of exploring if the stories are still watchable by modern standards. The first thing to say is that in terms of timeline and events, the two treatments are pretty similar. There are some changes in the order of events, but the one major difference is that 1941 uses a framing device of the narrator Hugh Morgan looking back at his childhood past, whereas 1975 places you right in the immediacy of the story. I think both approaches work for their respective mediums. Ayanto Morgan, three pound seven. Morgan, Ayanto. So I'm going to face these adaptations off against each other, looking at three criteria of storytelling, aesthetics, and finally, casting. So get your pickaxe and let's get into it. Firstly, 1941, the screenwriter was a guy called Philip Dunn, the condensing of Llewellyn's novel, which by the way, I've never read, I'll just say that. Um, the condensing of it into two hours of movie runtime obviously necessitates some brutality and a lot of the fat being trimmed from the narrative. Um, while the decision in the 40s to view the story through the eyes of Roddy McDowell's younger Hugh Morgan lends the movie a tone and a definite identity, I think it's also responsible for its detachment, if you could call it that. He's played by Roddy McDowell in visuals, but the whole story is narrated by a North American actor called Irvin Pitchell. Child could fall in love, but I am the child that was. Nobody knows how I felt, except only me. And the whole composite character of Hugh that these guys create is underdeveloped, and I don't relate to him. 1975, I think it just works better as a TV series. You've got six episodes of roughly 50 minutes. They don't focus on Hugh's story as the narrator, which not only gives it an identity separate from what was then a 30-year-old movie, but it also allows the writers to explore other characters and the community, which is vital in a story with so many interdependent characters and situations that they've got to react to. For example, the conflict of Reverend Griffith and the pious Mr. Elias. Um, this conflict lends the story a thematic subplot, which is hinted at in the film, but not fleshed out anywhere near as clearly. A bolt of fire from the skies, the vengeance of the Lord and the justice of God. But you have forgotten the love of Jesus. And that subplot, or that theme, should I say, is Reverend Griffith's distrust of ideological purity and religious or political sanctimony. But to come in here and work up all that venom over a petty fogging little quibble like three minutes on the hands of a clock, that is indefensible. The letter killeth Mr. Elias, it is the spirit that giveth life. Which is mirrored in the political activism and certainty of Yanto Morgan, and I love the way that the TV series now look is able to do that. As far as I am concerned, if you marry Yestin Evans, you have gone completely over to the other side. You won't do it then. Speak up in the church and say that this thing has got my blessing on it. A few things highlight a story's themes better than a good character arc. In the 1941 film, the Morgan brothers are pretty nominal characters. Their motivations, their conflicts, are not fleshed out. But in the TV series, that's different, particularly in the case of Owen and Yanto. How Green Was My Valley is essentially about nostalgia 
sadness and loss. And these are pretty negative and melancholy emotions. And the character arc of Owen, which I was not expecting, gives the TV series a much needed positive feeling at the end and some sense of hope. Good night, then, Yando. Little moments such as this are so applicable to today's climate that it connected with me. And I think it may do with you too. I used to be very strong myself on right and wrong and wickedness and so on. I used to be so sure about it, like you are. Only being as sure as that can make you very hard on other people. I don't suppose you'd have noticed, Boyo, but I've given it up. In terms of treatment, adaptation, storytelling, BBC 1975 is a clear winner for me. So, aesthetics. 1975, not such a standout victor in this area. Back on UK TV in them days, it was normal for shows to be shot on a mixture of film and videotape. That's because the video cameras were too big and cumbersome to take away from the studio floor into the outside world. So people of my generation were used to shows where they're constantly switching between video and film. So it's normal for me. But what I find is most jarring is not the switching of the visuals, it's the editing. Um, big moments, various big moments in the narrative, including deaths of some main characters and big actors are just not given those little reflective epilogus, uh, is that a word? Those little epilogue moments or scenes that as a modern viewer, we're just so used to, which I don't know, it's kind of, it's good in a way. It gives it a raw, unique and a more realistic feeling compared to today's indulgent, maybe over-reflective writing. Looking back to 1941, the biggest problem with the aesthetic here is it, it needs to be in colour. It really needs to be in colour because the whole theme of the film relies on the visual metaphor, the contrast of green valleys and black slag heaps. And despite the Oscar winning photography by um, Arthur Miller, you need colour for that to be driven home. Despite this big problem, I think, John Ford's use of regular, consistent array of Welsh folk songs combined with Alfred Newman's uh, score and the photography by Arthur Miller. I think aesthetically you've got to give it to 1941. It, like I say, it has an odd, dreamy, hazy quality, uh, famously described as a Irish Shangri-La, but it's kind of beautiful in a way. So, one all as we move into the final round, which is casting. So, um, Hugh Morgan, who's kind of the main character. Rhys Powis plays him in the BBC's 1975. Well, actually, two play him here. You've got Rhys Powis, and then Dominic Gard plays him as a teenager. Especially the Rhys Powis, the younger version, he's sweet, relatable, and authentic. Whereas 1941, Roddy McDowell is just a little bit weird, and the composite character he and Irvin Pitchell create, I don't feel like I know them, whereas I know Hugh Morgan in 1975. There's nothing wrong with Donald Crisp in 1941 as Gwilym, but Stanley Baker, you know, big Stanley, just understands this man and his family more. And the same goes for Shan Phillips, who was gorgeous, by the way, wasn't she? She was around my age when this was being made, around 42, 43. Wow, what a just stunningly beautiful woman and fabulous actress. And she knows how to play a Welsh man better than Sarah Allgood. And um, yeah, there's no getting away from that. lovely you are. Oh, I... It's Bronwyn. Is it? Yes. Oh, oh. Just like Gareth Thomas knows Mr. Griffith and his politics far more than Walter Pidgeon. And you all know the idea. You know where this is going by now, yeah? I think the 1941 cast are, are good. They're all decent. There's no problem with them and I don't object to them. Despite their 
Irish isms, but um, that will be explored in the episode of Cymru News, which is coming hopefully in the next few months. The 1975 BBC cast carry an unmatched authenticity that you just can't mess with. Stanley Baker, Sham Phillips, Neris Hughes, Reese Powers, Robert Gwillem, Aubrey Richards, Ray Smith lend an unmistakably real South Welsh twang and thrust to the whole thing. As for the English actors playing Welsh, you've got Keith Drinkle, who's excellent as Yanto, no issues with accent. Unfortunately, Dominic Gard, who plays the older teenage uh, Hugh, he just wobbles a little bit too much, as does his love interest, played by uh, Zayla Clark. It's himself. it's himself he's hating when he talks like that. Wouldn't tell my mother I was up with you. Then if I catch cold, I'll take the blame myself. What shall we do then? The standout performance for me is Sue Jones Davis as Anne Harrod Morgan. And her relationship with Gareth Thomas's Mr. Griffith, that frustrated, suppressed love and attraction, is explored and fleshed out in a way that you can do when you've got more time and a episodic treatment of the story rather than a two-hour movie. Hoping that you would. Will you give it your blessing instead? Well, how can I justify going against it? Easy enough, because you know he's not the one I want. You are the one I want. I mean, how you are shameless. Good. Now, this could be a little bit unfair, as Reverend Griff and Anne Harrod actually kiss in the 1941 movie, perhaps as a need for... Hollywood romantic convention. But despite this, I understand their relationship far more in 1975, and that could be due to either writing or performances. But I think the main reason why 1975 wins out for me is that despite 1941 containing most of the important story beats, I get a deeper and contextualised understanding of the story's themes from its roughly five-hour BBC run. So, there you have it. 1975 BBC TV is a clear winner by two rounds to one. Despite appreciating the existence and profile of John Ford's movie, the TV series touches me, you could say, in a way that the movie just can't hope to. Particularly its applicability to today's divided and intolerant political climate. And our proper concern to guide our brothers in Christ away from error and towards the light is debased into a sordid and lip-licking eagerness to turn over every stone in the hope that we may unearth the sins of others and publish them abroad. I feel that there's a message here that a lot of today's People who are maybe inclined towards protest or activism, and I suspect a lot of you know what I'm referring to here, need to pay heed to. What does it mean, Mr. Griffin? It means that something has gone out of this valley that may never be replaced. Home to your father and mother, boy. They need you today. Watching it has inspired me to go and seek out the book for the first time, which I will be doing soon. And of course, it has three sequels, which is something very unusual in the world of Welsh pop culture. Until then, I'll say watch out for the upcoming episode of Cymru Views. God knows when it's going to be. Explore the world. Explore Richard Llewellyn's world of how green was my valley, as I'm about to do. Talk about it. Don't take the existence of it for granted. I'm Nick, this is Wales in the Movies. I'll see you soon. Ta da! Do you know, last week I remembered something your father used to say God will never let anybody go home until they've finished their stint. <laughs>